55. Senator Drehan. Senator Limmer? Um, I couldn't help, Mr. Chairman, uh, to offer a friendly reminder. Um, uh, rule 12.03, or 12.3, uh, requires committees to post the bills three days in advance. Was that not done for this bill? That was bill? not done, and, and uh, we don't have a posting for Wednesday either. Or either yeah, Wednesday either. So just a friendly reminder that uh, the public usually likes to know what we're doing ahead of time. I agree with you, Senator Limmer, and thank you for calling that to my attention. Thank you. Senator Drehan, to your you. bill. Thank you, Chair Latz, um, and, and thank you, members. Uh, we, we do have an E-1 uh, amendment, if we could maybe move on that, Chair. Mr. Chair. Senator Lemmer. I'll move the A1 amendment uh, to Senate file number 255, I believe. The A1 amendment is an author's amendment. Be adopted as a matter of course. Senator Lemmer moves it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment's adopted. Senator Drehan. Thank you, uh, Chair Latz, and, and, and thank you for, for bringing this bill uh, to my attention and, and having a hearing today on this important uh, subject. Um, members, this was a bill that was inserted into the mental health bill late in last session. And anybody that worked on what we refer to as the competency restoration <coughs> knows that there was a few versions of this bill. And with negotiating with the House, we moved forward in conference committee um, with, with our bill. And there was a few issues with the bill. And this is um, a tightening up of the language and uh, removing some of the duplicate, duplication. And probably the most important part, um, changing the, the nomenclature or the wording or the title of competency restoration to uh, competency attainment. Um, it also adds on the last page uh, some money on line 32.3 to um, set up the appropriation for a board. Um, and then on page nine, um, this was one thing that uh, was added, um, and, and this was done by stakeholders and nonpartisan uh, staff members. Um, 9.26, if the court orders the defendant to a, a locked treatment facility or jail-based program, the court must calculate the defendant's custody credit and cannot order the defendant to lock treatment facility or jail-based programs for a period that would cause the defendant's custody credits to exceed maximum sentence for the underlying charge. I am not on the Judicial Committee. As you guys know, I've never served on it. And no offense to Chair Latz, I have no intention to ever want to serve on it. <coughs> but that is something that stuck out to me. Thank you, Senator Draham. Do you have any testifiers you wish to have present along with you? I, I do not, but I always, if you're okay with it, anybody in the audience would like to come comment, I would appreciate it. Is there anyone in the audience that feels compelled to testify in support of the bill or against the bill? Seeing none, any comments from members of the committee? All right. Senator Limmer? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move that Senate file. 255 as amended be recommended to pass and move to where? Mm -hmm. Finance. So moved, Mr. Chair. Does everyone understand the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Draham, thank you for your succinct and wonderful presentation. And you're welcome back to the Judiciary Committee at any time. Thank you, uh, Chair and members. Thank you. Senator Limmer, are you ready with your bill? 
Go ahead. All right, Senator Limmer, Senate File 186. Go ahead and make your presentation, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate File 186 requires the creation of an annual public summary report containing information about the operations of the Minnesota Fusion Center. Uh, it's an intelligence gathering and analysis component of the BCA, the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And um, we have a, uh, I'd like to point out, because we have new members on our committee, we have, this is an issue of, of privacy as well as transparency in government. Um, the uh, Fusion Center is uh, a function of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and it collects information on, well, anything from criminal uh, data to suspicious activity and it's a collection of data from various sources, but primarily law enforcement agencies all over the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm pleased to offer a strong, broad, bipartisan authorship on this particular bill. And uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, um, as I said, it collects, analyzes, and disseminates raw intelligence data and intelligence work uh, regarding criminal threats and potential terrorist activity. Uh, this particular bill requires a report, a summary report of a number of elements of data regarding this. Up till now, there has been really no uh, description of what this uh, fusion center actually does. And we thought it would be appropriate, and it's in the tradition of allowing a transparency on this function of government. As you may know or have surmised, uh, some of this data is delicate and it, is, uh, it references suspicions at times of activity. And uh, it's, it's important to realize that government or the public needs a little glimpse of what it does without being too specific to reveal information that may be costly to a criminal investigation. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have uh, Superintendent Drew Evans here from the BCA, as well as citizen lobbyist Rich Neumeister uh, in the room in the event that we have questions. Thank you, Senator Lemmer. And you do have an author's amendment, correct? The A1 amendment? Oh, yes. Um, Senator Lemmer moves the A1 amendment as an author's amendment. Yeah, I believe uh, I don't have a copy of that amendment uh, before me, but I can speak to it, I think. You want to speak to it uh, first? Yes. Uh, Go ahead. Members, if you look at the, uh, at the bill on page two, there's actually uh, too much printed in my bill. Uh, we have two references to funds or no funds, and I believe that the amendment requires us to remove lines 222 and 223 and uh, make the change on the paragraph reference on line 24, for striking C, and insert B. 
I would move the uh, A1 amendment as an author's amendment. Mr. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. <clears throat> All right. Uh, note we have a Min Koji letter in the uh, files here. Uh, uh, Rich Neusmeister has also submitted a letter for the file. Mr. Neumeister, did you want to offer any uh, direct testimony while you're here or not? If you like, come on forward right now. Chair Lance, Senator Limber, members of the committee, I think my statement uh, says pretty much a lot, but also uh, it's nice to be here. This is my first time testifying this year before your committee. It's a committee that I feel like it's home over the decades of doing a lot of good work with your predecessors and now continuing today. The bill, I think it's important to realize two things. One, this is a organization within an organization for 18 years, got millions of dollars of Homeland Security. Across the country, there have been issues of fusion centers, doing things of all, with groups of all political persuasions. And there's a lot of issues. Congress um, bipartisanly did investigations of it. Here in Minnesota, we, even though it's not as robust as other places, there still are issues. There is still a lot of not a lot of data available. And I think, as I say at the end of my statement, this is a great first step to bring some transparency and accountability. I sat on the privacy group 15, 14 years ago, almost 15 years ago, that helped develop the protocols of the Fusion Center. It was called MinJack at that time. Me and a gentleman that some of you may know as Bob Sikora, who was a, formerly a, a public defender. We were the two public members. So all we want to do, and this is a great bill, is what's under the hood. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the few moments of your time. And it's great to be back to regular, normal type deal things. Mr. Neumeister, welcome back to the committee. Welcome back home, I should say, as, <laughs> no, as I, you I, put you know, it. You, I, get, I think some of you may <laughs> um, All right, was there anyone else in the audience that wished to testify in connection with the bill? I know Superintendent Evans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. As uh, Senator Limmer explained, uh, this is a component of the BCA. Fusion centers uh, are, as noted, are, are centers that are located across the United States. There's approximately 80 right now across the United States. Minnesota has one. They were designed after 9-11 to be a hub and a hub and spoke model for information sharing to address some of the uh, information sharing failures that were identified through that process, hoping to thwart and disrupt attacks. While some of the work in the Fusion Center has changed since the time that it was prepared, we still face many attacks uh, to uh, whether it's mass violence that we see, threats to our faith-based institutions, threats to our schools in terms of uh, people threatening to do mass violence, other types of harms, and this plays a critical component in that process. In terms of this bill, uh, there are a number of components that, you know, in talking to people like uh, Rich Neumeister and others and senators and members of the other body, they believe that this uh, reporting would bring greater transparency to the work. And the work is vitally important to the safety of Minnesotans, so if there is a way to bring greater transparency and report on those activities, it's certainly something we do not oppose as part of that process. I do want to note just for this, uh, the, the committee that there is a very strong privacy policy that's in place. It's on our public website. You can access that at any given time. And much of the information, and, and, and we audit against that pro policy to ensure that people's individual privacy and liberty interests are honored as part of that process. And we view this report as another component of bringing that transparency to the process to ensure that we are honoring those privacy protections that uh, are in that privacy policy. And I'm happy to answer any questions and available at any time as this moves through. Thank you, Superintendent Evans. Are there any questions from the committee for the superintendent? Not seeing any. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Senator um, Limmer. Uh, one added point. Um, there is a report that, we'll, that we will require to be printed to the chairs and ranking my nem minority members of the committees in both chambers regarding committees that deal with jurisdiction and data practice and public safety issues. And the report will also be required to be posted on the Minnesota Fusion <coughs> Center website. 
uh, by February 15th of each year. Just wanted to make sure, and if you have any other need for details, the summary will provide all of the elements that would be included in that report. So, Senator Limmer, uh, the uh, bill does contain a blank appropriation line, and we have not received the number to insert in there yet. Right. So, uh, what we're going to need to do, because we don't have a number to refer over to the Finance Committee, what we're going to have to do is lay this bill over until some future hearing date when we get the number. Then we'll be able to move, hopefully, fairly quickly, insert the number as a committee, and then send the bill out. Right. to finance. I understand, Mr. All right. Thank you, Senator Limmer. So at this time, we're going to lay Senate File 186 on the table. Now, we're going to have Senator, we're going to reorder the agenda here a little bit. We're going to do the uh, Board of Public Defense appropriation. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask Senator Pappas to chair while we are doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Where's the other one? Where's the bill? It's this one. All right, got it. This is the author's amendment. Senator Latz. Thank you, Madam Welcome Chair. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. So nice to see you again. <laughs> A delight to be here, Madam Chair. <laughs> it is home. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I'm, I'm proud to present Senate File 355, uh, which is uh, an appropriation to the Board of Public Defense uh, in Minnesota. Uh, this bill really picks up where we left off last spring. Um, we were on the cusp of uh, supplementing the Board of Public Defense's budget so they could respond to what has almost become a constitutional crisis of resources in Minnesota. Um, unfortunately, it did not become law last year because there was not a final package that passed relating to uh, uh, public safety um, and judiciary finance. Uh, but it is a matter of some urgency, which is why it is proceeding on its own um, and early in the session at this time. Um, the uh, public defenders in the state provide a constitutionally mandated service uh, in representing indigent criminal defendants, those who do not have the financial resources to hire their own attorneys, uh, by definition, they are facing potential incarceration as a consequence of a crime that they have been charged with. And uh, 60 years ago, uh, the United States Supreme Court um, mandated that uh, they be provided with a defense lawyer if they could not afford their own to make sure their constitutional <laughs> rights are, are uh, fulfilled. Um, the uh, quality of our public defenders in Minnesota is very high. They provide excellent legal services, but the numbers of lawyers who are in the office to provide those legal services are not sufficient to provide um, terrific service to every person that comes before them that they are representing. They do the best they can. Some days it's more of a triage than uh, other days. Their caseloads are extraordinary, far above the recommended caseloads. Uh, so uh, their, their uh, handling of these extraordinary number of cases has also reached a crisis point within the criminal justice system because many other players in the system, the prosecutors, the judges, all the court personnel are often waiting around 
for the public defenders who are assigned to multiple courtrooms in some cases at the same time to finish up a case in one place so they can come over and get to another case in a different location. In the greater Minnesota County, sometimes that means traveling from courthouse to courthouse uh, to accommodate that. So adequate funding is not only necessary to fulfill their constitutional mandate, but it's a, a necessary ingredient for the entire criminal justice system to function efficiently. Uh, so with that said, um, the, uh, there was bipartisan consensus at the end of last session that a substantial increase in their budget, a supplemental budget, was necessary. Um, the uh, governor agrees um, and included that uh, increase in his budget um, just uh, last week. Uh, so what uh, I have with an author's, an author's amendment, the A1 amendment, is to um, adjust the uh, original introduction of the bill to reflect the numbers in the governor's budget. Um, and to that end, I offer the A1 author's amendment. Senator Latz offers the A1 author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Uh, Madam Lass. Chair, that's it for my personal presentation. I do have representatives from the Board of Public Defense here who would like to make um, a presentation to inform the committee about the role that they play and the need for these resources. Um, please introduce yourself for the committee and proceed with your comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Kevin Kyer. I'm the Chief Administrator for the Board of Public Defense. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, first of all, thank you to Senator Latz, obviously, for bringing this bill forward. Uh, for those of you who were here last year, including Senator Limmer, a thank you to you all, because uh, you all voted for something very similar to this, as, as Senator Latz mentioned. Uh, but we couldn't quite get it across the finish line. So um, just very briefly, for those of you who are new to the committee, we are a statewide public defender system. We handle about 125,000 cases a year on the district level. About 90% of all of the felony cases 90 plus percent of all the juvenile cases, roughly 65 percent of all the felony, or I mean, you should say the gross misdemeanor and misdemeanor cases. We provide mandated services in every courthouse in the state. Our appellate division handles almost all of the criminal appeals in the state of Minnesota. Uh, and the one thing to note, which I know we've talked to many of you about, is public defenders cannot refuse cases. So there's no ability uh, to say, hey, we've got 15 people waiting in the courthouse hallway, five of you or 10 of you are gonna come back tomorrow. We don't have that ability. Our public defenders don't have that ability. Madam Chair, in your packet, there was a uh, handout, and I would point you to page six of that, of that handout to talk about what this bill will do in terms of addressing the challenges that, that we're facing. Um, the first one is address, addressing staffing shortage and filling our existing positions. Secondly, to provide salaries comparable with prosecutors. Uh, and, and those two really are kind of interrelated, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. Funding our uh, employee insurance costs, and there's a small amount in there for our public defense corporations, which are non for nonprofits that provide service in about three to 4,000 cases that but for the corporations, they would be public defender cases. Madam Chair and members, currently the board is staffed at about 75% of the state and national standards that Senator Latz referred to. That is a when we are fully staffed. Right now we are about 67 lawyers short of even that. We have 67 vacancies around the state. That's roughly 14% of our lawyer staff. Even if we are at the caseload standard, again, going from that 75% to 100%, that really amounts to this. In a felony case, having about 12 hours of time per felony case. Those standards were developed in 1991, prior to DNA, prior to audio and video, prior to uh, the electronic forensics that we talk about now with our cell phones, with laptops, whatever. Um, so even if we were to get to that standard, uh, again, if you think about even just reviewing 
the video from a, a felony case, on average, that would still only be 12 hours of lawyer time per felony case. So that's the first piece that we would have. Second piece is recruitment and retention. Um, last year, 2022, we lost 14.5% of our lawyer staff to resignations. That doesn't include retirements. It doesn't include, include appointments to the bench. Um, roughly a third of the people who actually tell us where they're going, because we do do some exit interviews, but not everybody tells us where they're going, about a third of the people that leave are going to another public agency. Um, prosecutor offices, both county and city. Uh, we've even lost a few to the legislature, and we know that you all don't pay that well here. So right now, as I mentioned, 67 open vacant or open attorney positions. Our applications are down almost 80% from 2017 levels. Um, we got a report from our, our online application process. 50% of our applications or ap our openings now get fewer than three applicants per opening, uh, which it makes it really difficult not only to recruit people, but to try to diversify our workforce. In the Ninth Judicial District, uh, right now we have 40% of our attorney staff is vacant. Uh, our chief public defender who manages 17 counties, which is roughly the size of the state of Indiana, has 560 open files right now. She's not supposed to carry a caseload, but she's got 560 open files. We are losing staff to counties where you would not think that that was the case. The last three people that we lost in the Ninth Judicial District were to Beltrami, Polk, and Clearwater counties. So the counties have really you know, upped their game in terms of the salaries. Um, so part of the request, Madam Chair, is on, you can see on page nine, is to move our salary scale to that of the county attorneys. We took a look at what the the entry level for county attorneys is the highest one and then the highest uh, top of the scale and plug that number in. Now all this is sub subject to collective bargaining, we understand that, but this would be the goal that we would have in terms of, of moving that salary scale and likewise our support staff as well. It also takes about 17 years to get through our step process right now. On average, in a county attorney office, it's somewhere between 10 and 12 years. So not only are we not competitive <clears throat> on the entry level, as folks gain more experience, they start seeing that gap widen to the point where they're making maybe 25, sometimes $30,000 less than the person that's across the table from them. That's just not, from our standpoint, sustainable. Uh, again, we end up losing folks a lot of times to prosecutors. And what's really disheartening is we lose them at that four to five to six year level. So we bring them in when we can bring them in, we get them trained, they hone their craft, and then, and then they leave. So that's really, Madam Chair, it's very simple. Uh, I know you've heard this from another, a number of other agencies. Uh, I would say, as, as Senator Latz mentioned, this is a constitutionally mandated service. There's, there's nothing we do that isn't either constitutionally or statutorily mandated. Uh, and as you can see from the numbers in the Ninth District, this is a crisis. It is a crisis. So with that, I would, we would stand for any questions that the committee members would have. Would our uh, other witness like to introduce yourself sure. to the committee Madam and Chair, make Sure. My name is comments. Bill Ward. I'm the state public defender for Minnesota. I just want to echo what Mr. Kyer had said, but in, instead of using numbers, I'm just going to tell you that these caseloads are crushing on our staff, crushing. Uh, I appreciate Senator Latz's comments about outstanding work that we provide. I'm very, very proud uh, of this agency and, and all of the staff in the agency. But I'd be lying to you if I told you we weren't being ineffective. And that's something we should all be ashamed of. You do not get equal justice in this state at all. Uh, the case in, in Cuchiching County or, or Beltrami, you're not going to have the representation that you have, say, down in, in Hennepin or Dakota. So the reason I came to the state was because of the statewide system and the idea of equal access to justice. We do not have that today. We haven't had it for a couple of years. The other thing I want to talk about, and I've been doing this, I've been a lawyer since 1986, 
and I think that uh, um, Superintendent Evans, who was here earlier, would, would echo this. The practice of law has changed tremendously in 30, 35 years. It's just not the same. And there's no time available for our lawyers to do what's necessary for them to be effective or, or um, uh, straight on on every case. A typical domestic case now, you'll have four or five body cams, maybe 10 body cams to review uh, on, on just a response. The same is true on a DWI or driving after cancellation. And we have an obligation at some point to look at that documentation and that evidence. We have to do it. As Mr. Kyer said over and over again, the public defenders are subject to the same disciplinary rules as any lawyer, whether you're an in-house counsel or at Dorsey, right? We have the same rules we have to follow. It's virtually impossible to do that on a daily basis with these crushing caseloads. Last thing I'm gonna say is um, people wanna do the work, but they don't wanna be traumatized for doing the work. They're proud of what they're doing, but they're exhausted and beaten down because of the numbers of cases that they're faced with. That's why they're leaving. I'm not saying that salary increase is enough, or is enough to keep people on board. Caseload relief has to be a part of this package for people to survive in this agency. We literally, last Friday, we lost another manager in the 9th District. The same district that our chief public defender has 564 cases, her manager in Beltrami said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. That's the state of our agency. Thank you, Mr. Ward. Um, Senator Last, are there any other testifiers here? Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify? Yeah, Mr. Reynoso would like to testify, okay. I understand. Mr. Reynoso, would you just restate your name, please, for the tape? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, members of the committee. My name is Edward Reynoso. I am the Political and Legislative Affairs Director for Teamsters Local 320. On behalf of the Board of Public Defense employees represented by Teamsters Local 320, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Teamsters Local 320 represents over 10,000 members across the state of Minnesota, of which 650 are attorneys, dispositional advisors, paralegals, investigators, and tech support staff employed by the Board of Public Defense. We've been the, the collective bargaining agent for this group since 1999. I'm here today to speak out in support of the Board of Public Defense increase. The budget requested will provide competitive, comp competitive compensation the Board of Public Defense employees and to the Board of Public Defense employees and provide the agency the opportunity to fully staff its organization, which would make caseload much more manageable. The Board of Public Defense has unfortunately historically been underfunded and because of this, has been unable to provide competitive compensation to its employees, attract new employees, and retain current employees. As an example, lawyers hired as part-time public defenders are averaging 1,600 hours of work per year for the Board of Public Defense. This while they try and maintain their private practices. Half of the public defenders are required to provide 910 hours per year and three-quarter time public defenders are required to work approximately through 1,300 hours. The Board of Public Defense employees, employees represent 80 to 90% of the criminal defendants in Minnesota. They continue to face an extraordinary caseload, understaffing and insufficient resources, making it virtually impossible to do their jobs to the best of their abilities. Because of that, they are increasingly concerned that by forcing them, as required by, the, by law, by the Constitution, into these extreme and unmanageable working conditions, they express concerns that there is a risk of violating a defendant's constitutional rights. The Minnesota criminal justice system cannot meet its needs, reforms until the state actively supports its Board of Public Defense employees with an adequate budget which provides for proper staffing, competitive pay, manageable caseloads, and critical resources which will address the backlog of cases in the state. I look forward to continuing this extremely important conversation, conversation during this legislative session and hope the importance of the issues I've mentioned are given the value they deserve. 
thank you. I'm available for any questions, and if any arise. Thank you. Questions? Um, for Mr. Reynoso? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Reynoso. I didn't know if you said yes or no, Mr. Okay. Go, proceed. Thank Senator you, Madam Kruh. Chair. Um, and this may have been addressed, and, and the question is for anybody uh, on the panel. Um, and I apologize if, if this was addressed. I'm just trying to get my head around uh, as not being on the committee last time when some of these things were agreed upon in principle. Um, there are, my understanding, two kind of sets of public defenders, the, the contract ones that also have their own law practice and then full-time ones. Does this apply to both of those sets or just one? Make way. <laughs> Mr. Kayer. Yeah, Madam Chair and members, we do have two sets. One is our, our full-time and our part-time are, are actually part-time state employees, but this would apply to both of those groups. So. Maurice Senator Kroon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so with respect to the, the part-time or the contract ones, this would uh, presumably increase their, their rates and then you know, rather than salary, is that, is that a fair statement? Mr. Kerr. Madam, Madam Chair and members, it is. Again, they are, the, the part-timers are part-time public defenders, so they, they are paid on the same scale as our full-timers are, but just depending on if they're 75% or 50%, they get 75 or 50% of what a full-timer would. But they have the same benefit package, uh, they're in the same bargaining unit, so whatever's negotiated, they would, they would get. Senator Crone. Thank you, Madam Chair. This one is for uh, Senator Latz. Um, I, I'm looking at the, uh, the chart um, explaining the difference uh, between SF 355 and, and then your A1 amendment. Can you just kind of explain what kind of the thinking was for your amendment to adjust the numbers the, the way that you did? Um, Senator Kroon, I was going to ask Mr. Turner if he would go over the uh, what the finance finance situation is, if that's okay with Senator Lass. <coughs> Either okay. way, thank you. All right, Mr. Turner. Madam Chair and members, uh, what the bill does is it makes the full appropriation uh, of the Board of Public Defense for the next biennium. And that means it makes the appropriation of the base, which as you can see on the chart is $111,409,000 each year plus a 43% increase the first biennium and a 47% increase in the second biennium. That's the governor's recommendation. Uh, the, the original bill just appropriated 25, or 25 million in 23, 50 million in 24 and 25. Uh, it didn't address the base. And, uh, you know, that was an awkward way to do it. And so Senator Latz's amendment uh, makes the entire appropriation for the Board of Public Defense. And how we'll handle that is uh, this is going to go off. And if it becomes law, it becomes a chapter in Minnesota <coughs> laws. And, um, and as Senator Latz's budget bill comes through, the Board of Public Defense, which usually has its lines, will be zero with a note that says funding in Minnesota Laws chapter da 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 da. So we'll be taking this out of the <coughs> budget bill and it, we're passing the board's um, appropriation alone. And as for th this chart shows you uh, the base budget, the increase, which is line nine, 42 million seven hundred thousand. 50 in the first year and 52,900,000 the second year. The bill is confusing because uh, it's not confusing. The bill is, is drafted properly, but this chart breaks out the increase from the base. Uh, and line nine is the increase of the bill. And it comes to a 43% increase in the first biennium. Uh, Senator Kroon. Thank you. That, that actually was very helpful. And Answered my question, so right. thanks. Thank you. Uh, Senator Latz, so it's obviously your intention this bill goes to, on its own to finance and then goes to the floor. 
That's correct, um, Madam Chair. Um, I just had a question for you myself that with the AG's uh, appropriation, there was some dollars that were appropriated in this fiscal year. Um, did you give any consideration to doing that as well to the Board of Defense? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, yes. Um, and the original bill introduction um, <clears throat> did have the $25 million for this fiscal year as well. Um, and uh, that was originally intended to give them an immediate uh, bump. Uh, but uh, that's not the way the governor chose to approach it. Um, and we decided to harmonize our request with the governor's numbers. Um, I will also note that uh, last year, both the House and the Senate passed uh, $50 million appropriations uh, per year. In the course of negotiations, um, there were some adjustments made uh, to those numbers, but there was never a final agreement reached because we were all struggling with what the whole contours of the, the public safety uh, bill would look like. Uh, so the numbers that we have now from the governor's office in which I'm requesting uh, from the legislature uh, for the upcoming biennium um, are within that range and reflect um, a bit of an increase for the second year of the biennium um, as well to reflect the, the, uh, what will be some increased costs over the course okay. of that time. Thank you. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I do not have a question, but I did want to make a comment on the bill. Um, uh, you've heard me talk about uh, the responsibility of government or the purpose of government is the safety of its citizen, the primary purpose. But we have another obligation, and that's to uphold constitutional rights for those who are accused by the state, uh, and they deserve an adequate defense, uh, especially in the event that they cannot afford an attorney. And um, that's... Uh, as important uh, as the public safety factor. Uh, last year, we, as Senator Latz uh, said, we had a bill uh, that was very similar uh, in dollar amount as this one. This one's formatted a little differently for a longer term. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I in particular, I can speak for myself, I'm in favor of this bill. Uh, the uh, budget for public defense <clears throat> has not kept up with prosecutors. And I think uh, one thing uh, that I kind of realized late in my time here is that prosecutors uh, are funded by counties. And public defenders are not. They're funded by the state. And sometimes you don't have that direct comparison dollar for dollar or case by case. Um, as you would in another in any other kind of budgeting. So uh, we have fallen behind in our public defense budget, and that's why I'm in support of it. I recognize that, and uh, I would suggest we vote in favor of this proposal. Thank you, Senator Limmer. Any other comments? Madam Chair. S Senator Latz. Um, as, as many of you know, the bulk of my criminal, of my private legal practice is criminal defense. So I see this kind of work in the courtrooms every day. Um, and I work alongside the public defenders because I also do a lot of volunteer work in the courts giving free advice to defendants that don't qualify for the public defenders but don't have a lot of money to hire private attorneys either. Um, and so I'm in regular conversation with the public defenders, at least in my part of the world there. Um, and. Uh, I commiserate with them because they come in with a stack of files like this, and I come in with one or two files for court in the morning. And, and the privates who are there um, are a little upset when we get in line behind the public defenders to talk to the prosecutors because we know it's going to take a longer time for them to get through their cases. Um, but that's just the way it is. That reflects the fact that they're carrying 60, 70, 80, or 90 percent of the cases um, in, in some of these courtrooms. Um, and I also want to amplify on the, uh, the advent of, of video and recorded evidence. You know, even in a simple DWI case, there might be um, a squad video from one or two or sometimes three squads that responded depending on the circumstances. There's probably a body-worn camera from each of the one or two or three or four or five police officers who are there. 
There may be a surveillance video if the stop occurred in the presence of, say, a holiday station or something like that. Um, and, and there may be some disputes going on about exactly, uh, you know, who was driving, those kind of questions. Um, what was the driving conduct? And so you're really in a position where even if the stop only takes 30 minutes, you start adding these recordings up and you're spending several hours going through. And, and if you're really going to do the due diligence right, you may be looking only for one sentence there in which either the defendant says something or the officer says something that raises implications for their constitutional rights in the defense of the case on a factual basis. So you almost have to go through everything. Um, and that's a simple case. Uh, so, I mean, the, the amount of work per case to do the job right has really jumped while the, the resources available have not come anywhere near keeping pace with that. And that's why I think it's important just to make, bite the bullet this year, make the jump to, uh, to fund the public defenders at an adequate level so they can meet their constitutional obligations. And a lot of that, you want to keep the people in when they're trained and because they're the ones who, who can be most efficient. And because you got more people there, it reduces the workload for each individual as well. And that helps also keep them there. Uh, so I, I'm a strong advocate for this. I appreciate the bipartisan nature, having worked with Senator Limmer on uh, these issues for years, and I'd ask for your support. Um, and if there aren't any other questions or comments, I'm happy to make a motion. I don't see any other comments, Senator Latz, so I'll proceed with your motion. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I move that Senate file 355 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Senate Committee on Finance. Senator Latz moves that Senate file 355 as amended be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Finance. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Thank you, The bill members. is on its way to finance. Since I have the gavel, I have the liberty of also saying on the last bill that there were letters in the packet of support from NAMI <coughs> on behalf of the, uh, uh, the mental health community and also from Americans for Prosperity, um, a more conservative organization that focuses on criminal justice issues as well. Now, we will take up Senate File 34, Earn Sick and <coughs> Safe Time, Senator Pappas's bill. Um, if you want to make an initial presentation, then we're going to ask uh, council to identify for us the portions of the bill that are specifically within the purview and jurisdiction of this committee. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll just make a few brief comments and explain just a few items about the whole bill and then turn it over to council. Uh, members, everyone gets sick, and the pandemic was another reminder that when people get sick, they should be able to stay home not just for their own health or that of a loved one, but for the health of all of us. This bill would ensure Minnesota is a state where regardless of the color of your skin, your income, or where you work, you can be there when your sick child needs you, where you can go to the doctor before your illness goes from bad to worse, where you can take the time to recover from an illness or seek support in the wake of a sexual assault without worrying about missing bills or even losing your job because in many circumstances, it is still legal for workers to be fired for needing to take time off to care for themselves or a loved one. And this is also a public health issue since many of the employees least likely to have paid sick time in work and jobs such as food service we're choosing to come in and work while sick can have real health implications for the general public. Um, members, just briefly, Senate File 34 would mandate that all employees working more than 80 hours per year receive a minimum of one hour earned sick and safe time for every 30 hours worked. No employee is required to receive more than 48 hours of sick time per year. That's six days. 
And members, you know, in most jobs, you have probably 10 to 14 days of sick days. So this is really a very minimal. Um, employers would still be able to offer faster accruing paid leave or a higher amount of paid leave per year. Independent contractors are not included in earned sick and sick time requirements. It's paid at the same hourly rate as an employee earns from employment, and it can only be used for the following purposes, an employee's mental or physical illness or injury or their health condition, care of a family member during the same situation, absence due to a domestic abuse, sexual assault, or stalking, business closure due to weather or other public emergency, and an employee's inability to work in circumstances related to a public health emergency, or if health authorities or healthcare professional determine the employee or employee, employee's family members have been exposed or at risk of spreading a communicable disease. Um, and then uh, family members are defined as a child, a spouse, or domestic partner, a sibling, parent, grandchild, grandparent, et cetera. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I said I'd be brief, and I'd like to turn it over to Council then to just talk about what items are before us in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, thank you, Senator Pappas. Council? Mr. Chair and members of the committee, there are two summaries in your packets. One is a general summary on Senate File 34, and there is a specific judiciary provisions only summary, which um, highlights the specific sections in each article that are within the committee's jurisdiction. I'll briefly go over those. In Article 1, Sections 3 to 6 set up the legal framework for earned sick and safe time and specifically prohibit certain conduct um, like retaliation, discrimination, and provide um, requirements for confidentiality and disclosure. You'll notice in another section that there is an individual private right of action and um, the substantive pieces that, for, that give rise to that cause of action would be in sections three to six. Um, moving to Article 2, which is the Article on Enforcement, Sections 1 and 3 increase the penalties for um, employer violations related to um, records disclosure and repeated and willful violations. And Section 4 provides a statute of limitations for the private right of action of three years. And Section 5 authorizes a private right of action for the violations in um, Article 1, Sections 3 to 6. And Article 3 includes an appropriation to the judicial branch. And if there are any specific questions, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have Senator an A22 Pappas. amendment that's related to the judicial branch. I'll go ahead that and explain requested. your amendment, Senator Pappas. Go ahead and explain your amendment. Senator um, I'm going to have to ask Council to explain. I think it's what Ms. Priyanka just talked about. Okay. Ms. Pri or Mr. Turner, fiscal staff. Mr. Chairman and members, um, the A22 amendment just it clarifies the appropriation in the bill. Uh, in its fiscal note, this, the Supreme Court said that the, pri the creation of the private right of action would result in their need for an additional judge unit. And um, the original bill had the correct numbers in, but it didn't create the judge unit in statute. So what A22 does is it creates the judge unit. In this case, um, Supreme Court said the next district that is uh, up for a judgeship is, is District 9 in northwestern Minnesota. And then, uh, and then it uh, appropriates that specifically to the Supreme Court for a new, new judge unit in the 9th Judicial District. Um, other than that, the appropriation remains the same as the original bill, $1,000 for um, notice requirements, which is basically printing costs, and then the judge unit, four ninety four four hundred ninety four thousand and twenty five and um, 461026 and subsequent years. Mr. Chairman, I'd move the A22 amendment. Is there any, uh, any questions from members of the committee? Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Pappas, uh, regarding the amendment, 
uh, especially the uh, new judge uh, unit uh, appropriation. Uh, now I'm I'm only recalling, and my memory might be faulty, but uh, I thought rural Minnesota, namely uh, those outstate areas that are far from the Twin Cities, are losing population, and. I'm just questioning why we would be raising the appropriation for that judicial district when they're losing population, or are we anticipating more cases from there despite the fact that population may be changing? Do you have any knowledge of population shifts in that area? Senator Pappas. Mr. Chairman and Senator Limmer, I apologize. This came directly to the Judiciary Committee, and actually none of the judges talked to me about it. So I'm carrying this on their behalf, but um, I don't really know more than that. And you know, if the committee chooses not to accept it, um, or we can certainly revisit it in Finance Committee. This bill is going out on its own, and you know, figure out where the appropriation is coming from. In whose uh, budget originally most of my appropriations are in the Dolly budget. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Senator Loomer. Um, Senator Pappas, could you tell me who sponsored this language? Was it the Supreme Court? Mr. Senator Mr. Pappas. Mr. Turner, do you know? Mr. <coughs> Chairman, Senator Pappas, and Senator Loomer, uh, this language is in the House bill, but to go back to your other, and, and the Supreme Court did not request this. What the Supreme Court did is it was a party to the fiscal note. The Supreme Court said that the creation of this private right of action um, is going to increase their workload to the point where they're going to need another judge unit, okay? And of course, that workload is going to be spread all across the state. Right. The way, when, when this, when this, when the legislature creates new judgeships, it asks the court which district, according to your caseload workload study, is the next in line for a new judgeship. Mm -hmm. So the request was when the fiscal note came back, my House counterpart and myself requested from the Supreme Court, what's the next district up for a judgeship? And it was the ninth. Um, and, and that's simply the way the legislature creates judgeships with advice from the Supreme Court on, according to their caseload data, the next judgeship. And of course, it always seems funny because the workloads on, on any individual piece of legislation is gonna be spread all across the state. Mm -hmm. But you can only, I mean, you can only create one judgeship at a time. Mr. Chairman. Senator Lemmer. Um, is there anyone in the room that could speak in favor of this new judgeship? Um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Lemmer. Seeing no one respond to the question, uh, I'm not opposed to a new judgeship, but I, I'd like to know why, uh, or some formal request uh, that's <coughs> recognized by the Supreme Court. So just a, a tack on amendment uh, of a half a million dollars is, uh, is uh, concerning for me uh, without uh, some more formal justification. Um, usually we do it that way. And so um, an add-on amendment, I, I'm just a little cautious on adding it in this process. Uh, Senator Lemur, uh, maybe Mr. Turner has some more information out of the fiscal note that can yeah. help answer that question, Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. I don't know Chairman. if you do or not. I'm asking. <laughs> I'll do my best, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Senator Lemur. What the committee is working off of is a fiscal note that was created by MMB, and of course, they contacted the Supreme Court and they said, "What kind of impact is this bill going to have on Supreme Court?" This is. It's not a request by the Supreme Court, but it's a recognition by the court that if this bill passes, their workload is going to increase fairly significantly enough where they will require enough workload to equal one judge statewide. 
So it's, it's not a request by the Supreme Court, but it's a recognition within the fiscal note, and it is the Supreme Court signing off on the fact that this legislation will result in this workload for the court. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman Senator and members, Davis. I mean, uh, we can disagree that that argument is could be flawed, that do we really think it's going to increase their workload that much? Is there going to be, are there going to be that many lawsuits? I mean, most of these issues are really resolved with a, you know, a simple letter from the Department of Labor and Industry, because most employers obey the law, and they, um, some may just not know, and once they're informed, then they, they obey the law. So, does this seem like an opportunity the court's taking because they want another judgeship? I'm not saying that, but... You know, one could interpret it that way. And I think that it's really up to the committee. I mean, if I'm not sure if this is going to be funded independently through the Finance Committee or if it's out of Senator Latz's budget, um, certainly that's a big consideration if it's in competition with <coughs> other spending that Senator Latz wants to do. And maybe Mr. Turner could, could tell us, is it being carried here or is it being funded separately? I do not know that. Would it be carried here if it was funded? Mr. Turner, if you know. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, Senator Patrick. I'm just, you know, I think we're all a little confused sometimes when these bills run independently and not part of the usual process. So this bill will go to finance. I don't know if it'll come back here or where. I mean, most of, like I said, most of the appropriation is in the Department of Labor and Industry, so it's in the Labor Committee budget. This is a surprise to me. This just kind of came up this morning, um, and I think it's, you know, if, if we don't know who's going to fund it or where it's going to be funded, they may need another judgeship, and this just may, may be a way of getting it before the committee. Um, I don't know. Mr. Turner. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members, um, I don't think the protocol has been set out yet on how this would be funded. It could be it could go on to the Finance Committee uh, and the appropriation to the Supreme Court stripped out under the under, with the understanding that the judgeship is going to be created in the budget bill. Mm -hmm. um, I, or it could go on by itself and be tracked not within the judiciary spreadsheet. But as a separate but a independent bill. As a separate mm -hmm. bill mm -hmm. on the master spreadsheet. Right. Um, but I don't know if that decision has been made yet. Right. Senator Howe. And thank you, uh, Chair Latz. If there's a fiscal note and then we're asked to vote on something, isn't, wouldn't it be appropriate that the fiscal note be available in our packet or could, that we could see the fiscal note if we were going to vote on a, on a fiscal matter in, in the Judiciary Committee? Mr. Turner, what's the practice on that? Mr. Chairman, members, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, I have the fiscal note. Usually when we're in finance, fiscal notes are provided. I probably should have, uh, I probably should have copied them off and provided them here. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, Senator Pappas. I can talk to you about the fiscal no, it's, it's in the bill. It's in the second engrossment, um, which I don't know. I think I have the first engrossment here. Um, but the experience that we've had in the three communities that have this already, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Bloomington, is there have not been any, um, there have not been any um, lawsuits involved. And so therefore, there's not been any workload increase. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I just think if there's confusion or concern about it, I, I can just withdraw the amendment and we can think about it some more. If, if it's necessary, we could bring it back in the Finance Committee or the Chairman should just maybe consider in the scheme of things if you want to add another judgeship and not just use this, my bill, as the vehicle to do that. So I'll withdraw the A22 amendment. Uh, Senator Pappas withdraws the A22 amendment. Uh, members, we are going to copy the fiscal note now and distribute it. Uh, we'll have some more discussion on the bill, um, and uh, we'll see before we uh, act on the bill how the committee would like to proceed. Um, Senator Pappas, I do have a question about the uh, Article 2 
relating to enforcement and the, uh, the, the employer's fine has increased substantially over current statute. Um, and it's changed. It's, it's, uh, it, 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 do, it deletes the language rela relating to a higher fine for repeated failures, and it just has one $10,000 fine for each failure. Uh, can you give some uh, guidance as to how that change was arrived at? Um, Mr. Chairman, yes, I had that same question myself. Um, and that was, you know, I was told it was for repeated and willful violation. And uh, maybe we should make sure that's accurate. What page are you on? Well, there are two provisions, uh, Senator Pappas. On page 12, line 12.21, uh, it's relating to submission of records. Um, yes. And it, yes. that doesn't appear to specify repeated violations, just each failure to submit required records. Uh, on page 13, under employer liability, uh, line 13.27 is preceded by existing statute that identifies uh, repeated or willful violations for an increased penalty. And it might well be the conclusion or that the purpose of it was that $1,000 is way outdated and ineffective to change any employer behavior, and $10,000 has enough of a bite that it might uh, encourage compliance without needing to go there. Uh, um, but I'm inquiring. Mr. Senator Chairman, I, I'm, I called for a friend, and Commissioner Blissenbach is here to help with this question. Terrific. Commissioner, go ahead. Identify yourself for the record, too, please. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz and members of the committee. My name is Nicole Blissenbach, and I serve as the Commissioner of the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, and I can just kind of give a general overview. You are correct that there are two provisions, uh, two penalty provisions that are um, changed by this bill. The first is in situations where an employer does not produce records that the department uh, issues a demand for. Uh, so the penalty change there is that uh, a penalty of up to $10,000 could be issued in that situation where the employer does not produce records in response to a demand from the department. The second is uh, where a, an employer has willfully or repeatedly violated uh, the provisions of, in this case, the Earned Sick and Safe Time Bill. Again, that is up to $10,000, um, and that allows the department to take into consideration the egregiousness of the violation, um, you know, in, in the second situation, we're already dealing with either a repeat or willful violation. So it does allow us to take into consideration what that is, how many employees have been affected, uh, you know, what the, the damage really is from the violation that we're seeing. Um, so it gives the department some more leeway in, in determining what the appropriate penalty is for those violations. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, any other members of the committee have any questions at this time? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I've got a couple of questions. One would be, uh, how does this handle the union members that work for the union and then contract, when the union contracts gets a job for an employer, for a contractor? As far as I know, in union labor, you don't show up, you don't get paid. Uh, how does this affect those locals? All right, Ken. Um, Senator Pappas. Uh, Commissioner will help me if I don't quite have it right. Uh, if you have a, um, a prevailing wage agreement in your contract, then the assumption is that that takes account of uh, sick and safe times and other leave situations. <laughs> So that, that, if you have that, you have multiple employees and you um, abide by prevailing wage, then you're exempt from this situation, Mr. this law. Senator Howe. Follow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So that means depending upon how much I pay them de depends on how much, whether I have to pay them sick time or not. Is that what I'm hearing? Commissioner. Okay. Com Commissioner's going to help with this. Thank you, uh, Chair, members of the committee. Um, so the prevailing wage piece is, is slightly different than I think your initial question. Um, prevailing wage is, I think, different than a typical wage because the prevailing wage rate that is determined through the yearly survey that the department conducts includes benefits. So a prevailing wage rate is a base wage plus benefits, which could include 
sick time that uh, an individual is provided. So that's the reason why the prevailing wage exemption exists in the bill. Um, the, I, but I think your question was wh when you have a, a person who works for maybe numerous employers, um, which I think can happen in the, in the trades often, uh, the obligation in this bill is that uh, the employer, uh, so the, uh, has a requirement that for every 30 hours worked for that employer, one hour of earned sick and safe time be provided to that employee. Senator Hall, you know, I'm looking for kind of a simple yes or no. So if I pay someone <laughs> prevailing wage or above, I'm exempt from this requirement. Is that what I'm hearing? I, or doesn't it? That's, that's where I'm at. I, I, I don't want to know how it's all calculated. I'm just trying to figure out if, if I'm a union guy or if I'm not even a non-union employer and I'm paying above prevailing wage, do, does, does the one hour of sick time apply or, or, or doesn't it? No, no, Mr. Chairman and Senator, no, you're exempt because as the commissioner said, your benefits are calculated as part of your prevailing wage. So in, in some ways you're being bought out of your sick time. Uh, th thank you. You provided more in salary instead of sick time. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Uh, so how does it work? And, you know, because I'm a building official, I meet a lot of these contractors uh, that hire folks from out of state. And so the contractor doesn't employ these folks. They're a subcontractor. But the subcontractor employs these people and a lot of them are from Texas. So how does that, this law affect those folks from out of state for that out of state employer? Um, if you Senator are, Pappas. sorry, Mr. Chairman, Senator Howe, if you are working in the state of Minnesota, if you are a worker here, then your employer has to provide you with the paid sick and safe time. So this will affect the employers that come from out of state to do work in Minnesota? That's correct. Senator Pappas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Limmer. Thank you. Um, Senator Pappas, uh, uh, have you had any buy-in from the business community in Minnesota on your bill? Senator Pappas. Mr. Chairman, there's a small business organization <coughs> called, I think, the Main Street Business Association that supports this legislation. Okay. Uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, there's Thank small you. businesses. Yeah. Senator Pappas, uh, have you heard any word from, oh, let's say, the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce or the Business Partnership? Uh, are they in favor or opposed to this language? Senator Pappas. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't know. They haven't talked to me. Okay. Um, uh, members, there are letters in the packet from a couple of business organizations, including the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. I'll refer you to them. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, perhaps uh, either you or the commissioner might be able to help me understand how this would work. Um, we can accrue uh, this time. Uh, is, it, oh, is it capped at, let's say, per year? Is it capped over a lifetime of work with one employer? Can it be carried forward? Uh, can someone tell me how that works? Uh, Mr. Chairman Senator and Pappas. Senator Limmer, so you get uh, 48 hours and then you can carry over 32 of those hours to the next year for a total of 80. And that would continue into the future. So at no time would you ever have more than 80 hours that you'd be entitled to under this law. So Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Limmer. in order to qualify for that, you have to be ill or, or uh, some type of malady that, that would require that time off? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Limmer, yeah, I mentioned in the beginning, and it's in your packet, I believe, you do have to be ill 
uh, with an illness or an injury, physical or mental, or you also have to take care of a family member. You can also, you're eligible due to a domestic abuse or sexual assault situation if you need to go to the doctor or the hospital or to court. Um, if you're, the business is closed due to weather um, or another public emergency, um, and if, if uh, you are, have a communicable disease and you're at risk of spreading it. No further questions, Mr. Chair. Senator Cruan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question is about the increase um, in the civil penalty of up to $10,000 for each violation for each employee. Um, that strikes me as a incredibly uh, punitive uh, number because if we're talking about repeat offenders here, by definition, we're not talking about a single uh, instance. And so we're not talking about a single $10,000 fine, but we could be talking about, you know, if we're talking about two or three employees for three or four days, I mean, we're talking about a fine that would likely put the company out of business because generally speaking, we're talking about small businesses here. Most of the large corporations already offer these kinds of benefits. Um, we're talking about the Ma and Pa stores, we're talking about uh, very low dollar revenue stores, low employees. That's who's gonna be impacted by this bill the most. And so I, I guess I'm trying to understand the basis why you felt the need to increase the penalty from 1,000 to 10,000, which given who we're talking about here, $1,000 per employee per incident seems incredibly sufficient from my perspective. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll let the commissioner respond to that. Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. Um, members of the committee, so the, as I mentioned earlier, there are really only two situations where these increased penalties may come into play. It's one, if records are demanded and the employer does not produce um, to, to the department the records that have been demanded, and the second is when there has been repeat or willful violations. Um, so we're already talking about situations where we're giving an opportunity to comply with the law um, and we're seeing that it's not being complied with. Uh, the second thing I would state is it is up to $10,000. We are required by law when we're issuing penalties to take a number of factors into consideration. One of the things that we have to consider when determining an appropriate penalty, in addition to the egregiousness of the violation, is the size of the employer. And that is something that we're statutorily required to uh, consider as we're determining um, the amount of the penalty. Uh, penalties really exist for two um, reasons. One is to deter, de to deter bad con conduct, so uh, really promoting compliance, and the other is as to serve as a penalty, to, to penalize that bad conduct when it does happen. Um, so that's really the purpose. Um, I will also say that the department, uh, the goal is never to penalize, penalize, penalize. The goal is to make sure that employees receive the benefits that are outlined in the law, um, and that's always gonna be our top priority. We issue penalties in approximately 1.9% of investigations, not a very high percentage. It really is reserved for those situations where we're seeing egregious conduct, uh, repeat willful violations, um, or we're just not having any uh, co coordination or response to the department as we're uh, undertaking an investigation. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, but just to confirm my understanding of how this works, uh, by the time, I mean, the, under this, it could, let's say, there are th three employees, three days each. Uh, under my reading, that the, the civil penalty could be up to ninety thousand dollars. Is that days, correct? What does he mean three days each? Commissioner. Uh, Chair, members of the committee, um, it, it really depends on the situation. It would have to be a repeated violation at that point or a determination that the conduct was willful. And then the size of the employer would come into play, um, how many employees are affected would come into play. There are a lot of different things that were required by law to take into consideration when issuing a penalty. And Mr. Chairman, the commissioner already Senator said that Prince. In the past, they really uh, assessed penalties at less than 2% of the cases that were investigated. 
Most employers in Minnesota just need the proper information, which is why we have that in the bill to educate people to uh, know what the law is, and then they follow the law. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I understand that not all of these cases lead to fines, but I'm trying to understand the parameter of when a fine is implemented, what an employer is potentially looking at under this proposed law. And, and, and my understanding is, I know it's willful or repeated, but let's say it's repeated that leads to the assessment of the civil penalty. My assumption is that once you get to that point, you're looking back for all the violations, not just after you've notified them and they become a repeat offender. So you would look back to all of their violations that you'd have the ability to find up to at that point. So my question is, um, you know, if, if we're talking about three employees for three different days, even if they were notified after the first or the second, um, it would go back to the beginning. And th that, under my calculation, would be nine violations. And the civil penalty then would be up to $90,000. And I just want to make sure, and I understand that there's different variables and uh, the size of the company comes into play, um, but I just, for my own basis, I want to understand that I'm thinking about this calculation correctly. So in that instance, the civil penalty could be up to $90,000. Is that correct? Commissioner. Um, Chair, um, members of the committee, I am I think where I'm uh, missing the question is maybe a difference in the definition of repeated. So for us to consider a violation to be repeated, we need to have found a violation in the past and informed the employer of that violation. Then when that violation happens again, um, we can start considering it repeated. Senator Kroon. Thank you for that answer. So it, it's only after the notification of a violation that the, so, the so-called clock would start picking ticking for future violations that would be subject to civil penalty. Um, and if that's the case, where does it say that in the statute? Commissioner. Chair, members of the committee, um, that is policy uh, by the department. Uh, we, it's hard for us to prove that something's repeated when, there, when we haven't shown that there has been um, identification of a violation and uh, an employer being informed of that violation with an opportunity to correct. Ms. Mr. Mr. Chairman and, and um, senators, I mean, the reality is that this maximum penalty is really reserved for the most egregious violations of the largest employers who should really know better. Um, it's not something that your mom and pop business is going to experience because once they receive the cease and desist letter, they will follow the law. Senator Umo Verbatim. Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Pappas and Commissioner, I was wondering if you could just walk us through um, some of those plans to educate employers and, you know, in that scenario where you do find out about a violation, all the steps that the department is taking to, again, educate that employer and avoid um, getting to a situation where they're having to, to pay a fine. Commissioner. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee, um, and thank you for that question. Uh, education is one of the most important things that the Department of Labor and Industry does. Uh, whenever there is a new law under our jurisdiction passed that, impl or that affects employers and employees, um, we uh, take great pride in offering um, webinars and training sessions in person, um, as well as materials uh, to go out and ensure that employers understand their obligations and employees understand their rights. Um, so that takes many different forms. Um, with this bill, we're in a, a very fortunate place where Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, and soon Bloomington uh, have already passed earned sick and safe time ordinances, uh, and in some of those cities have been in effect for quite a, quite a long time. Um, so we can learn off of the uh, education efforts that those cities have already um, undertaken. Uh, build off of the fact sheets and the, the posters, as well as the community organizations that they've partnered with to, um, to really reach out into the community, to reach those small employers, to reach employees in every industry, to uh, make sure everybody understands their obligations and rights. Senator Lemmer. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, uh, in, in the setting when you have an individual city establishing uh, ordinance to this effect, if this passed, which one would preempt the other? Or would it be a doubling effect? Uh, could you tell me how that would work? Commissioner. Yes, uh, Chair, members of the committee, um, thank you for that question. Uh, essentially, the, the more protective of the two um, laws would be the one that controls. So if the ordinance is more protective, then an employer would need to follow the requirements in the ordinance. If the state law is more protective, they would need to follow the requirements of the state law. We see it with minimum wage as well. Um, Minneapolis has a higher minimum wage ordinance, and that's the wage rate that's required within the city. Well, Mr. Chairman. Senator uh, Limmer. Uh, just another mechanical question. In the event that an employee is moving from one location to another, um, which city would dominate? Would it still be under that same standard, whatever is the highest protective standard? I'm thinking of a delivery truck driver or someone who's moving from town to town, city to city, uh, sometimes in the course of one day. Uh, and I, I'm just wondering how this patchwork of ordinance works. Um, Mr. Senator Chairman, yes, Senator Lemme, you probably brought up an issue where um, a state law would be helpful. Um, I think it really depends on what the ordinance says. And I'm not familiar enough with the local ordinances to know where their workplace then would be, what it would be defined as. Um, so, sorry, I can't answer that question. Senator Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair Latz. I, I want to just go down that line of questioning where Senator Limmer went. Uh, we know in St. Cloud we have the speedy delivery delivery service, and they deliver all over the state. Their home place where they come out of is St. Cloud, but they may deliver in Bloomington and Minneapolis and Duluth. They're all over the place. What applies? Commissioner. Um, chair, members of the committee, um, in that so each ordinance, and, and I'm not going to be uh, able to recite them, but each ordinance sets forth a definition of when coverage applies and when coverage does not apply. Uh, so really, somebody who's doing work in the city of Minneapolis would need to look at that ordinance to see um, whether that work is covered under the requirements of that ordinance. The good thing about having a state uh, earn sick and safe time um, bill like this is that it applies throughout the state um, and can be enforced by either the Department of Labor and Industry or the civil right of action as outlined in the law. Uh, so it, it really is giving a roadmap to employers of here is the law that applies statewide and here is the what we need to implement. Senator Hall. Thank you, Chair Latz. So what I'm hearing is the employer has got a huge responsibility to track where his employee is going to work, and he's got to look through all of the ordinance where his employee may or may not be working it and trying to track how many hours he may be at at a certain location at any one time and day or week or month in order to track how many hours of sick time he may apply to a certain employee has anybody established the cost of what that's going to do to a small employer? Um, Mr. Chairman and, and Senator Howe, um, you know, we have a number of cities that have experience with this, and I'd be happy to check with them to see how they're handling it. Um, but I'm sure it's come up uh, over the years. They've had this, um, these ordinances, and they've worked out a formula or a plan, and I'll be happy to check with them and get back to you. But it isn't really relevant to this bill in front of us. Senator Howe. No, Mr. Chair, I... Uh, oh, you were just reaching to turn off your mic. I'm just going to reach to turn okay. off my mic because I tell you what, I'm... Being a small <laughs> business guy, I'm sitting here going, I'm glad I don't... I, I subcontract all my, my, uh, my folks, and they've got, they run their own deal because I couldn't track this thing. So thank you. I suspect there'll be an easy software program available uh, pretty soon for this. Senator Kroon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Um, I'm going to go back to um, civil penalties this time for the uh, failure to submit um, or deliver records under 12.21, 12.22. Um, and again, my question is going to be to this $10,000 proposed fine, which I find incredibly punitive for small businesses. Um, you know, and it says that it's $10,000 for each failure to submit or deliver records as required by this section. And I note that just in 12.18 through 20, it says the commissioner may require the records to be submitted by certified mail delivery or if necessary by personal delivery. And I'm just wondering if uh, an employer fails to um, <clears throat> deliver requested documentations in the manner requested by the commissioner, whether that's certified mail or personal service, would that subject them to this $10,000 penalty? Commissioner. Um, chair, members of the committee. Uh, so. Our goal in, in sending a demand for records is to get the records. Um, so if the records come to us and we have them and we can look at them to determine if there are violations, uh, it is and as evidenced by the percentage of investigations where we do issue penalties, we're gonna work with those records. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we issue penalties in about 1.9% of investigations. Um, and typically, we don't have a problem with employers submitting records in response to demands. Um, it's when employers are being um, trying to obstruct the investigation, uh, not respond, or um, that, that's really where we're seeing the penalties for failure to provide records come up. Uh, if a, an employer calls us and says, we have them in this manner, but we don't have them in this other man manner, we're going to work with that employer to ensure that we can get the records. Because that, again, ultimately is what we're trying to do is ensure that employees have received the benefits that they're entitled to under the law. Senator Cruin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I guess that's that may be current practice uh, in the commissioner's office, but I'm looking at this bill and um, what would become statute becoming law. And I, I guess if that's the current practice, I don't understand the need for 12.18 to 12.20 to be even in this statute to trigger potential civil penalties. Because as it reads, regardless of what the practice is, that would be, um, uh, it could subject an employer to a $10,000 penalty for not delivering the document in the way that the commissioner requested it. I think that's incredibly punitive. And if the practice is, is to work with um, the employer to get the records, I think the statute should reflect the current practice of the commissioner's office. Thank you. All right, members, uh, we've reached 2.30. Um, and uh, we have kind of an unresolved question about how to handle a potential judiciary appropriation. So Senator Pappas, if it's all right with you, I'm, I'm really reluctant to pass the bill on and then <coughs> have a judiciary appropriation either bypass us and be handled in finance or have us handle it separately somewhere else down the line while the rest of the bill has moved on. So if it's okay with you, I'd be inclined to lay it over right now and bring it back either Wednesday or Friday as our agenda permits. At that point, we can invite judicial branch to come in and tell us the basis for their request, and we can consider that along with the uh, rest of the bill for for a passage. Is that okay with the chief author? Um, that's fine, Mr. Chairman. My only question is Friday. <laughs> it's the first I've heard of that. Thank you. I think that's fine. Members, you should expect we'll be in in uh, committee on Friday. Um, all right. Uh, with that, then uh, we're going to lay uh, Senate File Thirty Four over, or lay it on the table. Um, and there being no further business before the committee at this time, we are adjourned.